Well, good morning, Shiloh. You know, we're well into the new year, and if my Facebook feed is any indication of your success, you are doing a great job with your New Year's resolution. I mean, from hitting the gym to spending more time with your family, I I mean, my newsfeed is bombarded with all these pictures of greatness, and you are certainly dreaming of and living into the possibilities of 2014. Now, I don't know about you, but I love the new year. Why? Because when we experience a new year, it's like we have this new, fresh air, this new breath of God's grace. It's like we have this cosmic reset button that we get to hit. It's a a new day, a new year, a new opportunity to have a clean slate, to, to start again, to start anew. Now, some of you are thinking to yourselves, yeah, 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 New Year's resolutions, I'm very skeptical of those. Why? Because no one ever keeps them. And you're kind of right. In fact, there were 141 million people in our nation who made a New Year's resolution this year. 141 million. That's 45% of the entire population in America, right? 45% of the entire population. That's a lot of people. And of those 141 million, only 8% will actually keep their New Year's resolutions, right? So not that great of successful rate. And so you might be okay to be a little skeptical, but it begs the question, can we picture the possibilities? Now, I have to be honest, I didn't make any New Year's resolutions this year, um, partially because I haven't had the time to really think about it. And the other piece is it to it, my life is absolute chaos. You know, this busyness uh, coupled with uh, sleep deprivation, I have a five-month-old who doesn't like to sleep. And so I call it infant sleep deprivation. And so I'm suffering from infant sleep deprivation. And when that happens to me, my mind gets cloudy. It gets really cloudy. I can't see no more like my brain refuses to picture the possibilities. It is all fuzz up in here, right? And so I know not all of you are going through this experience. Some of you have and some of you soon will be. But, but all of us have a time in our lives where we've experienced some cloudiness in our lives, right? When our vision has been fuzzy, where even though we want to picture the possibilities for our future, we can't. Our life feels chaotic. It feels dark. It feels overwhelming. It feels crazy. Maybe it's not infant sleep deprivation for you. Maybe it's the sudden onset of an illness. Maybe it's the darkness of depression. Maybe it's the pain of addiction. Maybe it's just this cloud of apathy in your life. Whatever it is, you can't see a vision for your future. You can't picture the possibilities for 2014. Your life is dark. It is chaotic. You can't see what God wants you to see. Well, here's the good news, church. God majors in chaos. I mean, it measures in chaos when we look at the beginning of our Bibles, when we look at the very first thing that we see, the Bible tells us that out of nothing, out of chaos, God created the entire world. Listen to this. This is Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and I'm going to read to you uh, the message version. I love the language of this. It says, first this, God created the heavens and earth, all you see and all you don't see. The earth was a soup of nothingness a bottomless emptiness, an inky blackness. God's spirit brooded like a bird above the watery abyss. I mean, maybe your life feels like that soup of nothingness, that bottomless emptiness, that inky blackness. Perhaps when you look around you, both in your personal life and the world around you, you say, this is chaos. This is darkness. I cannot picture the possibilities. But here's the thing. God has a vision for your life. God has a vision for your life. And it begs the question, can you see it? Can you see the vision God has for your life? Church, visions are powerful things. Visions are powerful things. If we can picture it, if we can see it, then suddenly that vision can become a reality in our lives. Visions are powerful. When I was in high school, this student teacher handed me this 
series of cassette tapes called The Mind Zone of Running. Now, I know some of you kids in this room don't even know what a cassette tape is, right? But I don't have something I can actually play these on anymore. But he, they handed me these cassette tapes, and in them were this, was this sports psychologist who kind of walked through you through this kind of meditation process, this visualization process. And in it, I was visualizing myself being an exceptional runner. There was this portion of the visualization process where the sports psychologist said, now picture yourself as a professional athlete. So if you were a runner, picture yourself as a runner. But, but also, if you're a basketball player, picture yourself like LeBron James. Or if you're a tennis player, Serena Williams. Or if you're a golfer, Tiger Woods, right? You get the picture? Exactly. So you want to play basketball. And so you begin imagining yourself playing basketball like LeBron James, and suddenly you start playing basketball better than you've ever played before. Why? Because suddenly you have a picture for what greatness really looks like. Suddenly you can picture the possibilities. It's amazing how we can envision ourselves being greater and better and different when we have a picture of that in front of our eyes, in front of our minds. Can you picture the possibilities? Or will you allow that soup of nothingness to cloud your vision? Well, this morning we're looking at an incredible vision from God. A vision that that partners hope with possibilities. A vision that God set out at the beginning of the Bible and also at the very end of the Bible as well. It's God's vision. The vision that God has had for all time, for all centuries. This is God's vision. So this morning, I want to invite you to open up your Bibles or pull out your sermon notes and turn with me to the very last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. We remember from last week, you know, we had that exceptional experience of entering into the presence of God and and, and envisioning ourselves experiencing that cosmic worship service in heaven. You know, the disciple John, the beloved disciple, he he entered into that cosmic vision of God and, and he saw God seated on the throne and 24 elders and four-winged beings all crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. This beautiful vision of the worship of God. And today we're looking at a different vision. In chapter 21, if you have a Bible from the gathering space, this is found on page 872. Now, if you don't have a Bible, we have Bibles like this one. They're absolutely free. Take one, write your name in it. It's yours. They also have these Bible reading plans in them. Now, we have been reading the Bible for an entire year, and on Tuesday, we will finish. Amen? Amen. Right? It's really exciting. 66 books, 1,200 chapters, over 31,000 verses in the Old and New Testament reading through the Bible in a year. Now, here's the good news. There are some of you who are slackers who didn't do it, right? (laughs) Right? And you can read the Bible anytime, anytime. And guess what? If you pick up one of these Bible in a year reading plans, it starts on Wednesday. You can give yourself another shot. There is always grace from God. And if you read through the entire Bible, don't stop reading. Don't stop reading the Bible. Why? Because the Word of God changes us. It gives us a new picture. We can picture the possibilities when we read God's word. And so today we're going to be reading from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 5. John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. God is proclaiming to us, I am making all things new. Everything is being made new. Now, sometimes when we hear these words, we think to ourselves, yeah, that's going to happen. When I get to heaven, I'm going to experience that in the sweet by and by. I will experience that kind of vision from God. But here's the thing. This vision from God is not just for the sweet by and by. It's not just for someday. 
This vision is for today. God doesn't wait to restore and redeem and renew and to heal all creation. No, God does that today. Heaven is here and not yet. It's both and. We are experiencing the kingdom of God come right at this moment and in the future. And so we realize that God wants to do this new thing in us today. Now, for uh, those of us who are part of this culture, it's great. Why? Because we're a culture of instant gratification. And so we want God to do something now, kind of like yesterday, right? We want God to do something in our lives right now. But here's the thing. When God gives us a vision for our lives, when that vision is from God, it's a vision that just doesn't happen after one glimpse. It's a vision that doesn't happen after a day or a month or even a year. We will live in for the rest of our lives the vision that God has placed on our lives. It is a vision that we will live into for the rest of our lives. Why? Because number one, that vision is big. That vision is big. When God places a vision on our lives, the vision is big. And let me tell you, it's bigger than you and me. The vision is bigger than you and me. It's bigger than our individual lives. Now, let's be honest. Sometimes we do think we're the center of the universe. Amen? I mean, we do. We think we're the center of the universe. Now, I'm steeped. uh, I'm in my 30s, and I grew up in a generation that we were, like, steeped in self-focus. My parents, everything that happened in my life and the life of my brother and sister, everything that happened in my parents' life, it was centered around us kids, all of our activities, everything we were doing, choir, running, basketball, you named it. Everything was centered around our lives. And so we kind of got this notion that life was all about us. Shocking, it's not, right? It's not all about us. And so we are not the center of the universe. God is. God is the center of the universe. It's in God that we have our being. It's in God that we have our existence. And it's in God that we have the vision for the future that we really need to have. What did the Bible say? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. What's amazing about that vision is it's not centered around human beings, right? It's about the entirety of creation. Not just us, the entirety of all creation. Do you remember what God said at the beginning? In the beginning, there was nothing. That includes no human beings, right? A whole vision of creation. What's amazing about the Bible is that God doesn't waste any words, and God's the same. What God was talking about in Genesis at the beginning, God is once again talking about in Revelation at the end, saying the same thing. The Bible tells us that there was nothing, and then suddenly, out of the water, God creates all of creation. What's fascinating about that is, think about baptism. Think about baptism. You know, when we baptize people, we dunk them into the chaos of water, and out of the chaos of water, they're made what? A new creation. God's creation story lived over and over and over again through the lives of individuals. That's why we baptize people. Because we believe God is making all things new. And so here is John having this cosmic vision of the entire world, not just human beings, but the entire world. And John is saying God is making all things new, a new heaven, a new earth. It is big. It is cosmic. And it includes everything. Beyond our lives, beyond our problems, beyond our habits and hang-ups, frankly, beyond our church, our city, or nation, if we're going to have a vision, even a personal vision, God's going to help us see how that vision incorporates the whole wide world. Church, your vision for your life has to be big. Bigger than you. Well, not only does it have to be big, but it also has to be clear. You know, so often our visions are not clear for whatever reason, sleep, you know, infant sleep deprivation or whatever in our lives, right? Our visions are not clear. But when God gives us a vision, it is clear. It is crystal clear. God has a clear vision for our lives. You know, God's pretty clear about his vision for us as human beings. If we go way back in Genesis, we remember the story about how God is desperate to be in relationship with us. God makes a promise, 
A promise to this older couple, Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah are well into their 90s when suddenly they realize that they don't have any children, and yet God says, you're going to be the mother and father of nations. In the Bible, both Abraham and Sarah laugh at that, right? Why? Because they think God's crazy, right? I mean, they laugh at this. And the real situation is God has a plan. God has a vision for all of creation. And through this one man and one woman, God is going to fulfill his promise. And what is the promise? I will be your God and you will be my people. I will be your God and all your descendants after you, all the families that are come, going to come from you, they're going to be my people. Fast forward to Revelation 21, verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Sama thinga, right? Same thing. God's vision is clear. Absolutely clear. God wants nothing more than to be in relationship with us. No matter how messy we are, no matter how many hang-ups or habits we have, God is clear, I want to be in relationship with you. And so when God gives us a vision for our lives, guess what that includes? It includes God. And not only does that include God, but it includes God's people, God and others. If we're going to have a vision for our lives, it has to be clear. Not only does that vision have to be big, not only does it have to be clear, but that vision is also complete. It is complete. You know, sometimes we live in a world where we think to ourselves, this world is going to hell in a handbasket, right? This world is awful. It's a dark place. I mean, just this morning, my husband told me this little girl who was shot in her bed, uh, he, he works at Riverside Academy, and that's where the little girl went to school. So he gets this message about this little girl. And we can think to ourselves, you know, Satan wins. Satan wins. The world is a dark place. The world is a, a very dark place. Satan wins. But that's not the truth. The truth is God has a vision, and that vision is complete, and it's eternal, and it's earth-shattering, and it's not tattered, and it's not broken. It is complete. And what does God say to us? Revelation 21. God says to us, and he will wipe away every tear from their eye, and there'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. It is true. It is true. Just this week, I attended the funeral of Tracy's, Tracy Meininger, her mother, Darlene Miles. And it was an, just an awesome worship experience. Darlene was a lover of Jesus Christ. One of those funerals where you want to be a part of, of what God is doing in that space and place. And as I was looking through the bulletin, I noticed that, that you know, the scripture for the sermon was Revelation 21, 1 through 7. I had already written my sermon, right? We could call that coincidence. We could call that happenstance. But I call that the movement of God. Why? Because God was once again reminding me and reminding us. I win. I win. It is done. It is finished. I'm the Alpha and Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. I win. No matter how many people die that we love, no matter how many little girls are shot in the city of Cincinnati, no matter how often a bomb is set out in Russia before the start of the Olympics, no matter what happens in our world, God is declaring to us, I win. I win. Church, God has given us a new vision, a new heaven and a new earth. It is big. It is clear. It is complete. It is a vision from God. And God has given each of our lives a piece 
a portion of that vision. What is your vision for your life? When you look over this next year, what is God calling you to do? What has God claimed for you to do? Church, what are you going to do? You may not realize it, but we have a big part when it comes into the vision that God has in our lives. We can do something about it. You know, a lot of times I'll just say, go home and think about that or envision yourself or picture the possibilities for 2014 and, and then you walk out of here and then you forget all about it, right? Well, today we're going to do something a little different. I want to give us some space to just imagine what God is going to do in our lives. I want you to imagine God's vision for your life. So right now, I want you to kind of get comfortable. Don't let your body be a distraction. Uh, kind of set up straight. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to imagine yourself just standing and looking over your future. You're looking over your future. What do you see? Now, sometimes we can allow all those hang-ups and habits, all that you know, inky blackness, that soup of nothingness to cloud that vision. I want you to see all that junk, all that mess, all that sin in your life. You see it? Now imagine God just moving it out of the way. Clearing the vision. Holy God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us so that we can see what you see so that we can feel what you feel, so that we can know what you know. Maybe you feel God saying to you, this year is going to be a year where you focus on relationship. Maybe you are a father who hasn't always been the father that you imagined yourself being, and so God is just pouring his spirit over you and saying to you, you know what, this is the year. This is the year to be intentional with your kids. For them to know that you're their advocate, that you're their cheerleader, that you're the person who's going to pour their heart and soul into them. Maybe this is the year that you're going to take a leap of faith and you're going to do something very different in your job. Not the same old, same old. Not the grinding coming to work. But you're going to say, no, God, I'm going to be the very best you feel in the blank that I can possibly be. I'm going to live into that vision that you have for my life. Or maybe, just maybe, God is going to wreck you in ways you've never asked or imagined. That God has this super big picture for your life. And you are scared to death by it. And God's going to ask you to step out and trust him. God's going to say, do you trust me? Do you trust me? Do you trust me? And you're going to have to say, yes, God, I trust you. Can you see it? Can you picture the possibilities? Does it make your stomach hurt? Because that's probably God if it makes your stomach hurt. God pushing you and moving in your life and saying, yes, that's it. That's what I want you to do. That's who I want you to be. You know, when God looked out over all of creation at the beginning of the Bible, God said it was good and not just a little good, but very good. And so God sees you as this incredibly good creation. And God wants you to see yourself the same way way, full of life, full of possibility. Holy God, when we go from this space and place today, I pray that you would just fuse our hearts, our minds, our bodies, our souls with your Holy Spirit, that you would open our mind's eye, that you would get rid of all that fuzziness and cloudiness and chaos and nothingness and insert right in there the vision that you have for our future. God, let, let that presence, let your presence 
be our vision. God, we pray this and we claim this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.